Decolonizing the Music Room centers Black, Brown, Indigenous, and Asian voices in music education and related fields. DTMR provides programs in the Fort Worth community, including the Black, Brown, Indigenous, and Asian Music Symposium, the Fort Worth African American Roots Music Festival, and the newly launched Community Visiting Artist Educator Program. Learn more about DTMR and check out their many offerings at decolonizingthemusicroom.com. I'm Loki Karuna, and this it's Triloquy. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Shout out to the returning listeners and the day one supporters. We couldn't keep this show going without you. To the new listeners, Triloquy is a podcast built to decolonize the conversations and general notions surrounding the phrase classical music. Each week I come here to shine a light on some of the latest arts news. I feature dialogues with folks in the arts pushing the needle of decolonization in their own ways. And I close things out with a Triloquy, my personal true and real for the week. For more information on Triloquy, to check out past opuses, and to contribute to the cause, visit our website, T-R-I-L-L-O-Q-U-Y dot O-R-G. In this week's Triloquy, I'm going to talk about human revolution, both generally speaking and as it's been applying to me lately. Looking forward to diving into that later on. Maestro Kellen Gray joins me before that to talk about life in Scotland as a black conductor working to expand awareness around black composers. Looking forward to sharing that with y'all as well. But for right now, I'm going to go over to Slipped Disc. Yes, our favorite (laughs) classical music news rag on the internet. Full disclosure, for folks who might be newer to this show, I have said some extremely flagrant things about Norman Lebrecht, who (laughs) drives the ship over there. You can go back in the the archive of opuses and and find it. A pre-Buddhist Loki was a little wild, but (laughs) last week, um, the website put out something that I thought was uh, worth sharing here. The headline is music director urges musicians to go conductor lists. I'll read a bit of the article here. It says music director Thomas Sondergaard suggested the idea of an orchestra spotlight series where the musicians of the Minnesota Orchestra put together an unconducted program because he wants to encourage the musicians to listen and react more to one another without a central figure dictating each beat and phrase. An orchestra is essentially a large chamber music ensemble, it says here, and working together in this way further hones our ears and ensemble skills, demanding that we rely even more on one another for musical and physical cues in communicating phrases, tempos, and articulation. Okay, so for folks without any Minnesota connections, Thomas Sundergaard is their new incoming music director. We all talk about You know, we can talk about why they chose yet another northern European man to lead the artistic side of the organization. That that is definitely a a conversation to be had. But today, focusing in on uh, this proposition is what I want to think about and what I had a, 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 a specific thought about. First and foremost, the orchestra on the other side of the river over there in the Twin Cities has been doing this thing for a while now. Shout out to the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. So, you know, When we talk about conductorless programs and conductors choosing to step off the podium for uh, the opportunity for musicians to collaborate in that more direct way, it's definitely something that we don't see um, as much as we do the the converse, the conductor, you know, leading everything. But it's not a completely new idea. So I just, you know, first and foremost, needed to shout out the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and the many other orchestras out there that are continuing to do this. Sphinx Virtuosi uh, is another one of those ensembles. Uh, I think there's definitely some merit, of course, to encouraging an orchestra to reach beyond the norms of being led by a conductor, because it does, I think, in some way inspire more musicality and creativity. Okay, but the other side for this, for me, is thinking about how much Maestro Sundergaard is being paid to sit a few concerts out, how much he's being paid to not conduct. Okay, I don't mean to pocket watch or to be (laughs) too nosy, but You know, I couldn't help myself. I took a quick look at their publicly available 990 for 2022, and it says that the then music director uh, pulled in a whopping $701,000 in income uh, that year, a little over that, actually. 
Now, maybe that's a reasonably middle ground salary as far as you're concerned. Shout out to everyone pulling in big Benjamins out there. But for me, for Loki, that is a salary that I can almost not even imagine. I like to make things real and break things down bi-weekly since that's how many of us live. So if he was getting a paycheck every other Friday, that direct deposit was around $26,000. Can you imagine seeing that much money pop up into your account every other week? Again, maybe some of y'all can, but that that would be something else for me. I mean, I would be free. That That is a dream. And I'm not here to shame anyone for the amount of money they make. You know, as much as I want to uh, connect the dots here, that's really the, the point. So I just want to make that clear as well. We have an incoming music director whose salary is likely comparable to his predecessors. And he's already talking about taking a few weeks off to give musicians the opportunity to, to make music together unfiltered by a conductor. Now, maybe he's, you know, taking a cut for those weeks. He's not waving the baton. Or maybe he isn't. But either way, I think it's worth shining a light on this because it's so easy to foreground what looks like a really great artistic idea that serves musicians and musician communities and, you know, your traditional audiences. But it's also easy in that same vein to forget about the larger overarching capitalist infrastructures that continue to oppress the working class today and through this infrastructure of so-called classical music. I think I may have mentioned it here before, but I'll say it again. There are big funders who have been given money to orchestras for over a generation that are now deciding to pull out of that game because they're recognizing that larger status quo aren't being shifted through the financial models and financial structures of orchestras. Yes, musical and artistic status quo are being shifted, but that's it. That's where it stops. I'm not sure if there's action that can be utilized around a broader awareness of this conversation, but all in all, it's something that came across my eyes and my mind this past week and something that I hope you'll remember the next time you <laughs> see a conductor taking the podium or choosing not to take the podium. It's very important for us to connect all of these conversations as a part of decolonizing classical music, at least in, in, in my view, we have to understand how these structures connect to broader issues and broader problems in our society. I'm not saying that you necessarily need to you know, cut the salary of uh, these conductors, especially conductors who have these ideas to uh, have conductorless concerts. But if we're more upfront about the money that these folks are pulling in, I think it's going to inspire some conversations that, you know, in turn can inspire some change or in inspire some shifts in the way we think about these structures. Anyway, all in all, there are a lot of conductors out there that I could, you know, easily wag a finger at, but there are many that are doing some really great work, including this week's guest, uh, Kellen Gray, who is uh, not only conducting music by black composers over in Scotland. Uh, he recently released a recording that features his work as a conductor and as a conductor of black classical music. Uh, so the latest album is called African American Voices 2. Uh, he and I talk about this album uh, in our conversation. We talk about life in Europe as a black conductor and a black person. And we also dive into how he engages this dialogue over here on this side of the pond. You know, why he's had to make a career over in Europe as opposed to making a career here in the so-called United States. A really great conversation. To get us into this chat, I want to share a little bit from the album. This is the tail end of the first movement of the Concerto for Orchestra by a Black composer named Ulysses K. I, I've, I've been familiar with him for a while. Shout out to uh, my teacher, Lacoli in Washington. Uh, years ago, uh, almost 20 years ago now, or 15 years ago, he put out an album of bassoon works by Black composers, and Ulysses K was one of them. That was the first time I, I heard this name. Um, and even so, I think Ulysses K is still a, a composer whose name is relatively obscure, even amongst folks uh, who listen to black classical music. So it's an honor for me to uh, put this on your radars today. Thanks to Kellen Gray and the Royal National Scottish Symphony Orchestra. Music by Ulysses K here to get us into my conversation with maestro Kellen Gray. Hope you enjoy.
I would say definitely South Carolina uh, has an influence who I am, you know, as a person, as an artist. I mean, um, you know, I think we present as artists um, who we are as people. And considering how long I spent in South Carolina, you know, basically from ages zero to 18, you know, go away to school to be a professional. And then my professional life took me back there when I was working at the Charleston Tiffany for the almost five years that I was there. Um, and during that time, not only, you know, just being a resident in the low country again and, and participating in the symphony and working there, but also entrenching myself uh, in Gullah culture, living in a Gullah community, uh, specifically doing deep scholarly research uh, into the roots of American music that comes from African American culture, so on and so forth. But, but to answer your question, as far as if I guess being natively from South Carolina, 100%. Um, you know, I think the particular town that I grew up in, Rock Hill, South Carolina, had a huge influence on me, not, not necessarily on how I became a, a classical musician, because frankly, when I was living there, classical music was the farthest thing that was a possibility for me, um, and, and people in my community. In fact, I didn't know anybody that did it didn't it was never really a thought in my mind until uh, a violin was presented to me in the public school system but i think just the character of the town and how the town is in and of itself prepared me for all the rigor of the life in classical music uh, you know it being a, a blue collar textile mill town until a lot of the jobs from the mills you know closed down in the uh, early 2000s and late 90s or so so just sort of the work ethic that goes with a town like that um you know, it being a town that puts such an emphasis on sports, it's literally called Football City USA because mm. uh, it produces, if not the most, some of the most uh, NFL players of any town, like per population in the entire United States. And uh, and sad, but but true fact, I mean, it's, it's a town that also didn't fully integrate until the mid-70s. Mm. Uh, and so even when me growing up there in the mid-80s, early 90s, you know, there's still, you're, you're just still very aware of how the lines and intersections of race and class uh, can affect your life, you know, for, for good, bad, or and how one must conduct themselves. And so it forced me to have sort of an unflinching look on a lot of the things that we're just now getting comfortable talking about now or somewhat comfortable, uh, I should say, and a lot of things we're dealing with in our industry now. But, you know, I've been facing those things since, you know, I was knee high to a duck. So um, so I'd say all the things about growing up in Rock Hill trained me for all the things that have been non-musical that I've had to go through in the classical music industry. Yeah, especially when the history is right there in your face. You know, so many of those plantation houses are still standing. You know, in my grandparents' town of Sherald, you still have the slave auction block in town hall that they will not dismantle. Maybe, maybe it doesn't need to be dismantled. Maybe we don't need to forget, you know, but but uh, you, you make a really great point there. Uh, I wonder if you can speak. You, you mentioned uh, Gullah culture. You know, we, we used yeah. to say uh, Geechee. Uh, culture. A lot of people don't don't know that exists. I wonder if you could just speak more to to what that is. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of a lot of folks might know it more as Gullah Geechee culture, as you mentioned. You know, uh, some folks have moved away from the Geechee term because that was one sort of ascribed to the people as the one that Gullah that would have come from within the people. But mm -hmm. you know, that that debate is for another time, and I'm not I'm not a, a full scholar to be able to speak on that. Uh, but what I can say, as far as defining Gullah culture, is that geographically. People would know it as basically the region from um, Jacksonville, North Carolina, down to Jacksonville, Florida, ironically, and from about 30 miles inland on the eastern seaboard. And basically a lot of the geographical isolation that those that would be descendants of slaves or African diaspora people in the sea islands of those states uh, would have been able to preserve some of the West African traditions that would have come, uh, that they would have like basically passed down from generation to generation while enslaved you know, on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Um, and for me, as far as how that corresponds to my life in South Carolina, though I grew up more inland than those 30 miles, so much of the traditions moved in uh, with that. And obviously, you know, with Charleston, particularly being in South Carolina, being the largest slave seaport in the United States, like literally bringing in about 50 percent of all the enslaved people that came to North Carolina came through Charleston. Actually, I want to say it's more than that. It may have been about 70 percent, um, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly, with Gaston's Wharf being, you know, such a huge port. Um, forgive me for not remembering the exact numbers. but um, but so many of us came through that port. And as the chances are, if you are a person of African descent and your ancestors were enslaved here, you probably came, someone in your line came through that port. But anyway, I say all that to say that so many of those uh, musical traditions, dance traditions, the folk music that I grew up with would have come through that region. Um, and so many of the words and language that I grew up with within my family was from Gullah culture. And then literally sort of through, I guess I can tell the story later because I'll get into like a 15 minute long story of how <laughs> I ended up moving into a Gullah community basically in Charleston County, uh, the area of Mosquito Beach. 
um, area, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, oops, sorry, I, I sort of lost my train of thought there. Um, but so many of the, the, the art and culture traditions that I would have grown up with were influenced by color culture. And so that means literally having one's own language that's sort of this amorphous uh, 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 alteration of English and also other languages um, uh, of, of, of many of the, the syncopated dance rhythm, rhythms that we think about from early pre-era jazz, pre jazz era dance forms or, uh, or subsidiaries of Gullah culture, things like jubas, cakewalks, mm -hmm. um, those are eventually rhythms, things that would turn into foxtrots, that would turn into swing, that would turn into early jazz, uh, rags, so on and so forth. All those things came from there. And so it's been, you know, since I can remember, it's all sort of been a part of my life and a part of what sort of made me as a person, especially artistically. So we can talk about Black history in the United States, especially over there on the East Coast. But what about Black history in Scotland? Did you find yourself doing any of that research? Did you know any of it before you got to Scotland? What, what was that story? You know, admittedly, I have, I'm not yet a Scottish scholar, particularly uh, and sadly not in, in Black culture, just here, African diaspora culture just yet. Um, it was one of the things I planned to do when I actually got here. Uh, when I came to Scotland at first to, to join the RSNO, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. But if I'm going to be 100% honest with the rigor of the schedule, conducting schedule I've had over the past two and a half years, it's not allowed me to get as deep into it as I would like to. But I've been very fortunate to be able to share my culture uh, that I brought over from the U.S. with the people around me, and particularly internally at the RSNO and, uh, and I should say all over Scotland because of the way they sort of embrace me and champion me. Um, you know, most orchestras are not in the business of championing and supporting assistant conductors, um, mm -hmm. or really promoting their careers. But this particular orchestra has been an incredible, incredible sort of family to me, of moving me forward and, and helping me sort of um, not just build a career that I want, but build the identity and be the person that I want to be, like within, you know, this classical music field, which just from the color of my skin and the place that I'm from, you know, that's not necessarily always. Um, the most familiar to everyone or sometimes even the most comfortable. And so I, I commend them for doing that. But to get right to your question, sadly, I have not done as much. Uh, I'm peripherally familiar with some of the, the history of African diaspora people in Charles, I mean, in, in Scotland, but not as deep as I would like to be. Well, you're creating some of that history for future generations. You, you know, a, a lot of orchestras in the United States have done a better job in the past, uh, you know, four or five years of programming uh, black composers, but it's still an uphill battle, largely. Uh, it seems right. like it would be even more of an uphill battle in uh, in Europe, namely Scotland, where where you are. What's what have your experiences been really diversifying programming on that side of the pond? You know, if I can actually, if well, I was going to say to be perfectly honest with you, I will be nothing but perfectly honest with you during our time together. But <laughs> I would I would honestly say it's actually been easier on this hmm. side of the pond than it has been in the U.S. And I think his, and, and I, and that, that surprised me initially, but historically it's been the same way. I mean, how many people that have, you know, skin that look like ours over the last hundred, several hundred years have had to come to Europe to do the art that they want to do? You That's know, true. whether it be the conductor, Dean Dixon, whether it be the composer, Edmund Thornton Jenkins, who was from Charleston, who I, you know, have some, some wonderful connections with and who I've studied, you know, for so long. Uh, I've seen so many of uh, writers, musicians, uh, various artists uh, that are black from the U.S. have had to come to Europe basically to make the art that they want to make, and I think that's still sort of a sad truth. Um, I'll I'll admit it was one of the reasons that I came here. Um, I don't feel that I was necessarily particularly directly subjugated um, as an artist personally, but I do feel like there's still some barriers, even you know at that time that we're addressing these things the past four or five years, as you mentioned, that still create some otherism around black mm -hmm. conductors, where basically. If I'm going to get the call from the U.S. orchestra, it's going to be to perform music of composers that look exactly like me, which I love to champion. I mean, it's so much a part of my programming aesthetic and who I am as a person. But sometimes I feel like it's the only thing that U.S. orchestras will let me do. Whereas I come here and I get to be a complete artist, not only uh, on this side of the pond and particularly in Scotland. Uh, do they let me, you know, not let me, I should say, do I feel completely unsat, un, uh, what word I need? Uh, unyoked to do all the quote unquote standard repertoire, but to also mm -hmm. do the things that you know are really special to me. To do Evan Thornton Jenkins, to do William Grant Still, to do William Dawson, Margaret Bonds, Florence Price, and there's a hunger for it. In fact, I would say that you know when we look at programs back in the U.S., 
often it's kind of the same, you know, 10, 12 composers we're looking at. Beethoven, right. Bach, Brahms, Mozart, so on and so forth. Where I've found there's generally a wider variety uh, within the programming. And there's sort of a hunger for music that people haven't heard before. And I think that's part of been, been part of the success of the two albums that I've recorded with the RSNO is that people want to hear new music. And so I guess in short, it's actually been a little bit easier uh, on this side to, to introduce music of, of Black composers than it has been in the U.S. to some degree. When it comes to creating these programming, these programs and including of uh, historically marginalized composers, you know, unfortunately, there are those who are completely opposed and want to stick uh, strictly to the so-called canon. You have folks like me that will wish every orchestra would just do an all black season and let's just cut it out. Um, and then there are folks who are <laughs> somewhere uh, in the middle. I, I wonder how you engage this question of balanced programming, especially as it relates to those black composers you just mentioned. You know, I love the I I love the term that you use, balanced programming, because you know it really it really challenges what we think as balance. And so, you know, I think for a lot of orchestras, when you think, oh, we need to diversify our programming, and so what is you know what does that percentage look like when we are diversifying programming? Mm -hmm. You know, is it you you now is like now you have three black composers and two women composers and uh, maybe one composer of Asian descent and Latin American descent like on your season now, which means it's basically still 87%, you know, dead white male composers. Um, and that doesn't still sound like balance to me. Um, you know, what I would say, one of the, the things that we really need to get over is create is this sort of otherism around composers that aren't male and European, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, as much as there's so many, I mean, a plethora of works by them that I love and that we, that we play. But I think that otherism makes us only put the work of Black composers and women composers on programs only for Black composers and women composers. Mm. As opposed to just, you know, programming them, scheduling them as a, uh, according to the aesthetic in which they wrote and the quality of the music in and of itself. I mean, there's as much as I love to do programs that are um, that are all black composers. I shouldn't have to wait till February to, to, <laughs> right. to conduct. I shouldn't have to wait to February to conduct William Grant Still. I mean, nobody can tell me that you can't put William Grant Still's Second Symphony and Ravel Piano Concerto in G Major on the same program. Not only, you know. Do those pieces uh, coexist on the same program? But I think if you actually listen to the music and you think about the DNA of the music, impressionism, and uh, so much of the music that comes from Grant Still or William Dawson or Florence Price, we're talking about pentatonic, uh, quartal and quintal harmony, uh, things that are, how do I say this? Um, the same DNA that basically made the early jazz forms and things that, uh, that we use for the source, uh, source materials for spirituals are the same things that that, uh, that Impressionism come from. And so just hint, hint for everybody listening out there, listen to a William Grant Still Symphony and then listen to the second movement of Ravel Piano Concerto in G Major and tell me those two things don't go together. Um, <laughs> and, so I think that, and so I think that's really more where we need to head is listening deeply um, to what the, on, listening deeply to how the music sounds and programming according to that. Now, in order to get there, I think people need to do kind of what you suggested, not necessarily maybe having a whole season of Black composers, but I think conductors and arts administrators need to challenge themselves to listen to a lot more Black composers or maybe have a month, a week. I like to listen to new music every single day. Challenge themselves to, to delve as deeply as possible into Black composers so that they become uh, more widely referenced and know how to better uh, pair those with things that are considered the traditional canon. And not to mention the conversations that could be cultivated through these pieces of music. You mentioned William Grant still too, you know, song of a new race. What does that mean? And how do we really get into, you know, this, this idea that he was tapping into as it relates to us. So th th there's always so much, uh, but you mentioned, you know, folks uh, challenging people to really broaden their ears and, and their scope. Um, when you're making a case for black composers in Scotland, who are these people? I wonder if the um, if the hierarchies or systems are similar um, there as they are in the United States. Are are you talking to boards of directors? Are you talking who who are, who are these conversations with? You know, most of the time they're with directors of artistic planning at various orchestras, and I, I feel very lucky that you know the number of that I've been able to speak to here in the UK, particularly in Scotland, have been very progressive and not only willing uh, to take on work. But most of them realize that, you know, I'm the person with the expertise and they're willing to actually have the conversations and do more listening than talking. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's not always some programs that I'm conducting. It's I might get a phone call. Hey, Kellen, we have so and so coming in to do a program uh, where we want to do this piece. What are some other works we might be able to program around this? Um, and so in that opportunity, I get to sort of basically have these conversations that we're mentioning and not just send them a list of recommendations, but actually talk about the composers, talk about their rich history, uh, how they might pair with other things, telling them what to listen for, giving them a list to listen to and not just to put on this program. Um, mm-hmm. And then also, frankly, referring them to other Black artists that can, uh, that can you know, actually lead these programs uh, uh, rather than just, you know, asking me to, to program it for someone else. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about actual personnel. You know, what has it looked like for you to put black bodies on the stage beyond just the black pieces of music? Mm-hmm. You know, I just as you know, obviously, you know, Scotland is a much more racially homogenous country than the U.S. I mean, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong; there are plenty of brown people here. I mean, from many different continents uh, all over the world. Um, and sadly, well, I shouldn't say sadly, but I've not reached the point in my career yet to where I'm a music director and I have direct control over the personnel that's on the stage. Sure. Um, but I do get to recommend some of the artists that I directly collaborate with when it comes to charity um, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I'm always um, looking to similar minds that have not just people that look like me, but people that also are experts, you know, in the particular repertoire that I like to uh, perform. And luckily, those two things align quite often. So. That is the domain that I do have some control over um, at this point, both here and as a guest conductor abroad. And so that's usually where I sort of um, use a little bit of leverage at that point. Sure, sure. And uh, I did want to loop back. You know, you did mention that for you, through your experience, it's been a little easier to uh, have these dialogues and do this work, you know, in Scotland as opposed to the United States. I wonder if you bring that perspective or that conversation back to the U.S. when you when you come here? What's, what have been your experiences sharing that truth with stakeholders on this side of the pond? Yeah, you know, um, it's been an interesting journey regarding that, you know, growing up in the U.S. and spending most of my professional life in the U.S. and then sort of being, you know, getting my, getting my uh, proverbial blue check getting uh, verified uh, in Europe. And I think a lot of times, if I'm going to be very honest, that's the case for a lot of conductors, um, particularly American conductors. Um, you know, there can be a little bit of a stigma that American conductors do, you know, uh, only a certain amount of repertoire do certain things. And so it feels honestly great to have come here and receive the quote unquote seal of approval, um, but also to get the real sort of open, um, how do I say this? Uh, sorry, may, may I start that one over? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no I kind worries. of lost my train of thought there. Um, but it it feels great to have had been able to come this side of the pond and really sort of get to to stretch my muscles and really get to dig into this repertoire uh, without so much of a um, uh, a microscope uh, over me. I mean, frankly, you know, being born so many so much into the musical traditions, the music that I get to conduct here. A lot of American music, a lot of African music from African American composers, and also the standard canon. I really, as I've said before, sort of gotten the permission to pair these things and put them together. Um, and because I am one of the only voices championing it here, it's been nice to have, be able to have some influence over it. Um, how that relates to coming back to the U.S., you know, frankly, having the seal of approval of the orchestras that I've been able to work with here, the, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, the Philharmonia, the English National Opera, I think sort of give some orchestras back in the U.S. some reassurance that I know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about, uh, <laughs> frankly. But it's it's really given me a chance to to stretch my muscles and really get to play with these pieces um, and really learn, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Give myself a really a amazing opportunity to sort of um, exercise these and get them into my DNA. I mean, it one of the most the most musically rewarding experiences I've ever had in my entire life has been recording these two albums with the RSNO, not just because they're a fabulous orchestra and it's not just because repertoire that I love, but it's an orchestra that's really willing to get their hands dirty and dig deep to find what makes this music really connect. Um, you know, all of the music that we covered, not all of it, but most of the music that we covered uh, from Margaret Bonds, William Dawson, William Grant Still, and Forrest Taylor Perkinson come from folk music, uh, have African-American origins. And we've spent time in rehearsal with me singing the original settings of these spirituals, me demonstrating jubas, cakewalks, uh, emphasizing like how this how this particular setting of blues within a William Grant still, how to make it sound more like an original blues, 
and they're willing to actually listen to me sing in rehearsal, me for me to stomp and clap, and willing to actually get to know African American music. I can't think of another orchestra on earth that's actually spent a two year exploration in the performance practice of African American composers. Wow. Um, and to work with an ensemble that's world class, that's willing to delve that deep in the performance practice and, and grow a specialty in it has really helped me, not just them grow a muscle in this, but it helped me develop my own muscles. And so when I come back to the US, things operate a lot more smoothly. Um, not just because, you know, I'm more experienced in it, but also because frankly, a lot of the orchestras in the US, despite not having played these specific composers, have much are still familiar with a lot of the genres of music, the, the influence of jazz, of box trots, of uh, to some degree cakewalks and jubas, at least understand the snap rhythms that are around it and how it should sound. So it usually translates just a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's been a, it's been an amazing exploration to sort of exercise them here and bring bring them back to the U.S. Yeah, before I ask you about African American voices, I'm just curious: uh, are folks over there familiar with? the Bernsteins and Copelands and, and the other side of American repertoire. Yeah, you know, people are familiar with Bernstein and Copeland and Gershwin. Um, it's not played as often here as it is in the U.S., obviously. But transversely, in the U.S., I don't hear anywhere near as much Elgar, Vaughn Williams, mm. or, uh, or Britton. Um, and I think that's just sort of the nature of what it is, people playing their own. Um, but I've, I've definitely experienced some really, really marvelous concerts. Uh, of Gershwin and Copeland uh, here. In fact, at the Arsenal, we did uh, the Symphonic Dances of West Side Story not long ago. I've experienced a number of really wonderful Gershwin performances. And um, particularly when I actually perform some of the music from African American Voices One live with the Arsenal, it was really wonderful to hear the audience's reaction to the end of uh, the third movement of uh, Grant Still's African American Symphony, Afro American mm-hmm. Symphony, to hear the quote unquote, I got rhythm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> quotation, I should think pre-quotation before right. Gershwin. And so it was really, really wonderful to hear their their humorous reaction to that. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're celebrating African-American voices too, but um, just to back up a little bit from that, what was the reception from uh, African-American voices one? How, how did people think about that when it came out? Well, I, I say they thought enough of it to allow us to do a second one. Um, yep. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so, you know, we had a lot of success with the first album. I, um, you know, I, I have to admit, I was, I was fully confident in how well we performed these works and fully confident that we presented them in a really wonderful light, but I wasn't sure how eager people were to, frankly, at least on this side of the pond and in some parts of Europe, listen to three composers they've probably never heard of before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I'll quote the, the RSNO's chief executive, Alistair Mackey, and saying, People loved it more than they thought they would. And I think that's not only evidenced by the sales of the album, but also from us performing the album live and the reception that we received to it, which was really heartwarming. It was literally standing ovations and multiple stage calls. Uh, And I think not just for me in the orchestra, but for the music in and of itself. So how did you encounter the composers on African-American Voices 2 for the first time? Uh, You know, all of the the composers on African-American Voices 2, Margaret Bonds, Ulysses K., and co Taylor Perkinson have always sort of just been revolving in my uh, musical orbit for the past mm-hmm. several years. Um, one of my, I should say, one of the, the, the most significant shifts in my life was my time spent at Chicago Sinfonietta as a, a, a Paul Freeman uh, inclusion conducting fellow at Chicago Sinfonietta, studying under May Ann Chen. Um, and it's an orchestra that's directly dedicated to addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in classical music. And of course, the uh, the founding music director of Chicago Sinfonietta was Paul Freeman, uh, who the fellowship is named after. And not only did he found Chicago Sinfonietta, but he was his life's mission to basically promote the DEI in classical music and particularly African-American voices. Um, not everybody knows that Paul Freeman is one of the most recorded conductors in all of history. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only the 25 years, as I'd say, he spent as the music director of the Czech National Symphony and the number of works by Black composers that he recorded with them, but also with the, uh, I believe, forgive me if I get this wrong, but the, either the NBC Orchestra or the, uh, I want to say he did a six album set for Sony of African-American composers. And so but honestly, through his recordings and through his legacy, which I've modeled some of my career after, did I found out about a lot of these composers, everybody from, I mean, I already knew about uh, William Grant Still and William Dawson, uh, but I found out, uh, and I knew about Forrest Taylor Perkinson from his albums. I learned about Ulysses K, I I believe, from his albums. Um, 
other works that he recorded. And so he didn't necessarily record the ones on African-American voices too, but I found out about all of those names through basically looking through his catalog. And from there, the inspiration he provided to my life, basically doing as much deep research as I could on uh, composers of African descent for the past, I guess, almost decade now that, um, you know, we're not quite quite decade, uh, maybe about the past eight years or so. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've dedicated my life to, to learning more and more about. When I think about how I came upon these three composers, you know, Margaret Bonds, just through my own research, you know, as a as a radio producer, uh, Ulysses K from uh, my first bassoon teacher, Lacoli in Washington. I don't know if you know him, but, you know, I do know uh, in Washington. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, and then, of course, Coleridge Taylor Perkinson. Uh, I first heard his name um, with the uh, when I was involved with the Gateways uh, Music Festival Orchestra. So I, I think my my point is, you know, it wasn't music school that exposed mm -hmm. me to these composers. Basically, it was black people. Uh, do you think there's yeah. something to that? Should we attribute that to uh, these composers still relative obscurity in 2023? Oh, 100%. 100%. I think so many of the ways that these names have spread have basically been through us. I mean, the, the names of the composers have been spread like the music has been spread you know, over the last centuries. It's been word of mouth and, like, and basically through our communities. I mean, maybe you can perhaps attest to this. Um, how many orchestras and how many individuals and programmers of orchestras, or orchestras administrators, basically since the pandemic and the murdering of George Floyd have reached out to you directly or to other <laughs> black musicians you know directly to ask, who should we be playing? I've been busy. <laughs> it's, you've been, we've been busy. We've been busy. It, that's how it's been out. I mean, I think that it really speaks to the fact that our institutions have not been passing along this knowledge, that we've been the ones passing along this knowledge. I think, if, you know, for... I would challenge basically every arts administrator, every director of artistic planning to think back about your time in school, your time in conservatory, and think about how many Black composers you actually learned about. Um, would look, Take a look through the Daniels Manual um, before it was online and see how many Black composers are actually on it. And the few that were listed were listed in African-American composers and not just listed generally throughout the manual. Mm -hmm. So I think you're 100% right. I think it's really been passed through us. Um, I hope that that culture can change. Um, I hope that's an evolution of the uh, quote unquote awakening that we've had. Uh, I don't usually like to use the term awakening because we always do. Um, yep. we, we're not, we, did, we did not awaken to it. We just have to face, uh, we just now have to deal with the repercussions of, of ignoring it. But um, but I would say you're 100% right. I think it, it's mostly been passed through us. And I hope that, that we now can look to basically uh, more more organically institutionalized the repertoire of African-American composers. So the Montgomery Variations by Margaret Bonds is a piece that um, I've covered a lot on, on this show. It's, it's really a, a, a favorite piece of mine since I first heard it performed by the Minnesota Orchestra. Um, yes. One of the things I love so much about it is its direct connection uh, to that activism and to that black history that you can't separate from, you know, really marching and being on the streets as well as the spiritual. Uh, I yeah. wonder if you could speak to why you consider this a, a vital piece in, in her catalog. Sure. You know, well, first off, I'll say the piece spoke to me immediately just from hearing it, you know, growing up uh, in a small church in Catawba, South Carolina, uh, Liberty Hill Missionary Baptist Church in Catawba, South Carolina, we sang uh, I want Jesus to walk with me all mm -hmm. the time as a child. And that particularly is the spiritual that Margaret Bond's Montgomery Variations is based from. And then you spoke to her, uh, uh, the peace connection to activism and to the civil rights movement. It's one that she wrote in inspiration for and dedication to the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King as it relates to the Montgomery bus boycotts. Um, you know, so much of the music of the civil rights movement is, is basically our music. I mean, it was, you can't really separate the two. And I think that it's important I think her particular work in this particular piece is important because it really sort of documents this uh, and puts this in the classical setting to where I think it brings not only attention uh, to the folk music, you know, that we have basically uh, brought and presented uh, to America and to the world, but shows an example of how this music is of equal footing uh, to any other folk music that we may want to present or in particularly uh, folk music as a source for classical music. How many uh, classical composers actually use folk music uh, as their inspiration for their classical music? A lot of them. Tchaikovsky, yeah. Inastera, Bartok, Brahms, Beethoven, all the Hungarian marches you heard in Mozart. 
it's been the same throughout all over time. And I think that, you know, this, it really sort of uh, illustrates that, you know, as, as Duke Ellington would say, if it sounds good, it is good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think you can't really discount, uh, you know, our own music and our own contribution. I think she is really, um, has done a wonderful thing by sort of highlighting that in this particular way. And it's also her only, I believe, or fully orchestral work that does not involve voices. Yep, yep. At least the only one that we know of as it's of yet, you know, who, who knows what we'll discover. You know, yeah. I, I think it's safe to say, at least from my perspective, that Ulysses K is probably the least familiar composer on African-American voices, too. I'm familiar with his connections to uh, Paul Hindemith. If I'm remembering correctly, there was a Russian tour and there's a, a an image of Ulysses K with uh, Shostakovich. Uh, I wonder, you know, if you could speak to why you included Ulysses K on this album again especially considering that most people even black folks haven't heard of him yeah i you know i listed ulysses k on this album specifically for the reasons that you mentioned because most people haven't heard of him but it doesn't mean the music isn't excellent um he is literally when you think about you know underrepresented voices or forgotten voices he is the perfect example um not just because he was an incredible musician an incredible composer i mean the number of composition awards that he won if you look through his bio speaks to that in and of itself. The aesthetic of the, I'm sorry, the uh, the quality of the music of the compositions that he wrote, everything from his uh, Concerto for Orchestra, which we feature on this particular album, which was written not long after Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra, uh, his fantasy variations, his works like Pieta uh, for English horn and strings, basically his chamber music. I haven't heard a piece by Ulysses K that I didn't think was fabulous. I think one of the reasons he was lost is not only you know him living in such a uh, uh, tumultuous time, you know, frankly, of the 20th century and being subjugated, um, you know, due to the color of his skin, but also considering the aesthetic of music he wrote. Uh, He wrote, he was alive and composing at the height of his powers during this time in which tonality broke in classical music. And so many composers had to choose a path, either atonality, uh, which was the more popular path at the time, or continuing to compose in a much more, let's just use the term, aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Uh, or immediately aesthetically pleasing uh, manner. And, and most composers, at least American composers, sort of turned their backs on that at that particular time. So he was sort of, you know, doubly marginalized as writing, um, you know, music that was tonal, modal, used, but modernist, but still using sort of uh, folk music and American uh, rhythmic elements, but then writing it in a style that was still tonal and modern, as opposed to many of the composers like Perez who had been writing atonally. Um, but yes, so I, so for me, I think he was just, he was an obvious choice to try to introduce uh, to the world or, or better introduce to the world, I should say, uh, because he's just an absolutely amazing, astounding composer and, uh, and sadly just has been overlooked for a long time. And I think a lot of that can also apply to Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, you know, again, for people not to be confused with Samuel Coleridge Taylor. I have I've yes. really, you know, in addition to always being an advocate for black music, um, I'm a huge advocate for new music, you know, living composers, but, you know, music written, you know, closer to the 21st century and, and in the, the 21st century. What's your um, what are your views on the inclusion of new music you know not not just new to us music but music that is you know less than 30 40 years old mm-hmm. well you know i mean at some point all music was new music and so i think it's absolutely essential when we look back in history you know whether it be i'll just use for example whether it be beethoven or mozart or haydn one of the things that was a feature and in fact one of the most forward looked forward to features of their live performances was improvisation uh mm-hmm. was hearing a piece for the first time to be able to be privileged enough to be in the room to hear a first performance of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, of Mozart's 39th Symphony. Um, granted, I know there can be some associations made with new music today where people don't may not find it to be as aesthetically pleasing, whether it be, you know, music could be, whether it's atonal music, whether, frankly, I've heard some people describe it as pops and squeaks and toasters and bathtubs, which, hmm. you know, literally was some settings of some pieces, um, which I do find very neat. Uh, but I think, that, honestly, there's there's so many voices out there and there's such a variety of voices of composers and aesthetic that there's new music out there for everybody. I particularly love new music that is mostly tonal or modal, um, highly rhythmic, uh, usually based in folk music or popular music, um, and particularly music that I would have been surrounded by before I was a classical musician, 
And frankly, I think for a lot of people that think they may not like new music, they will probably like the same. Uh, and some composers, you know, that come to mind immediately that, that personify uh, the, the type of new music I love the most so far is Jesse Montgomery, mm-hmm. Carlos Simon, Rena Esmile. Um, oh gosh, who else out there? Uh, Carolyn Shaw, um, Erilyn Wallen, who happens to also be a, 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 a black composer who lives in Scotland. Uh, who I've had the opportunity to meet a few times and uh, and and do some of her works. Uh, there's so many. There's so much wonderful music out there. And so for anybody that thinks they don't like new music, I think you just haven't heard a piece that you love yet. Um, it's that it's definitely out there. I definitely agree. Well, I, I like asking this question of uh, to people who have done recording. I wonder, you know, for you, what are the differences between preparing for a concert versus preparing for a recording session? Mm, that's ooh. You know, for me, there's not much difference preparing preparing for a recording versus preparing for a live audience. Um, and it's only because I try to actually, one of the things I try to do when I'm in the recording session is give as much energy as if I'm in a live performance all the time. Uh, and I think that's the biggest challenge when you're in the recording setting is that you don't have a live audience there. You don't have that sort of constant push to excel for the, the the utmost expression, the utmost cleanliness, the utmost tidiness of performance, but you have to somehow keep reproducing that in the room. Uh, but I'd say as far as preparation, one of the things that I do take um, is having being absolutely prepared for my my um, uh, my best rehearsal settings and understanding, particularly in doing music uh, of African American descent, like we're talking about here, with an orchestra that may not necessarily have a rich history with it is being really ready to explain how something should sound, being prepared to sing a phrase, being really prepared to um, to speak to every single aspect of performance practice and not just take it for granted that they know it. Uh, which, you know, I didn't necessarily fully anticipate when we were recording the first album, or at least in the first, you know, uh, days of the project. But it, as I mentioned before, it's become an incredible, incredible experience being able to really delve deeply into this music with this orchestra. And that's turned into a, now uh, a two-year exploration in the African-American folk music and classical music performance practice. So now that African-American Voices 2 is recorded and and, uh, out to the world, what do you have your sights set on next? Oh, gosh. Uh, Well, I have a full season in front of me. Uh, At at the moment, I'm uh, working as an assistant conductor on La Traviata at the English National Opera. Um, I look forward to returning to the Royal Scottish National Orchestra for concerts later this year. Uh, programs with the Philharmonia Orchestra here in London uh, next month. Returning to the Charleston Symphony for concerts. Uh, oh, wonderful. Louisiana Philharmonic uh, next month as well in November. Uh, I, quite busy. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, con- when I'm not actually making concerts, I'm going to continue my research uh, into African American folk music performance practice as well as learning more and more music by African American composers in hopes that there might be a third album. Okay, great, great, great. And tell Anwar hello when you get down there to Louisiana. <laughs> I certainly will. I absolutely will. Yes. How can people uh, learn more about you, keep up with all of your performances, and uh, buy African American Voices too? Uh, you can you can buy African American Voices too on Lynn Records, on Amazon, uh, on Apple Music. Um, you can also find me at kellengray.com. That's K E L L E N G R A Y dot com or at Kellen Gray Conductor on Instagram. So um, before we close, we can talk a lot about uh, Black composers and even Black performers, but I do think, you know, we have to uh, acknowledge Black audiences or, you know, the lack thereof. Platforming these composers um, and even these aesthetics, you know, when we talk about uh, Margaret Bonds's uh, I want Jesus to walk with me setting in uh, Montgomery mm-hmm. variations. You know, you mentioned the Juba dances um, and uh, William Grant still won. You know, one of my favorite things about it is how in that first movement, you know, you get that opening English horn solo that reminds me of somebody singing the spiritual. Then we're getting into the jazzy stuff right after. The, so it's just black on black on black music. Yes. And with all of that said, that's not enough to get my mama in the concert hall or, you know, my, 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 my auntie. I wonder from your perspective, what are the other steps that you think we Mm -hmm. all need to make musicians, presenters, institutions, conductors to really get us in those seats, listening to this music? 
That is the hundred million dollar question, isn't it? I'm so glad you asked it. Um, you know, one of the questions I'm asked most often in, outside of the interview setting is, you know, how do we uh, how do we diversify our programming? And frankly, I think if you start there, you're skipping a lot of steps. Mm-hmm. I mean, it needs those things that orchestras already know. It's just, are we willing and brave enough to take the measures? You know, our boards, our, our audiences look like our boards so often. And I think one of the first things you need to do is put aside the performative uh, initiatives um, that make us look more diverse from the outside in. And let's really start uh, taking a look inside and see if we can do this from, a change from the inside out. Honestly, I would say if, if orchestras want more folks that look like us in their audiences, you need to start by having more folks that look like us on your board. Um, you know, board culture is the organization's culture, whether it's, and we, and we basically build our board according to our values. You know, uh, fundraising boards uh, say something about the values of an organization. Working boards say something about the values of an organization. So diverse boards say something about the values of an organization. So that's where I would tell people to start. Um, from there, it would start with our, I would move from our boards. We also, that, uh, that opens up lanes for new partnerships. Uh, that opens up new lanes of communication and uh, and frankly, it changes the uh, an orchestra's orbit when you change your partnerships to make them much more diverse and more folks that look like us. From there, I think some sort of the change in the audience is you know uh, intrinsic to those processes. But that's where I would start looking again at the uh, the processes that change uh, the individuals in the actual offices and on, on the individuals on stage and the orchestra in and of itself. Um, and with the partnership of those people. Do we start looking at our programming and things that offer music that is more uh, representative to our own backgrounds, I would say. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I want every orchestra to play more William Grant Still, more William Dawson, more Margaret Bonds, more Florence Price. I want you to play Flo Shawande, Edmund Thornton Jenkins. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want you to play Jesse Montgomery and Carlos Simon. Uh, gosh, who else do we want you to play? Um, so who am I missing? More Ulysses K, more Cole Taylor Perkinson. Um, gosh, I want you to play more Trevor Weston. Like, I mean, play all these composers, but don't start just there. Um, so please put those on your programs, put those in your season, but don't make those the only thing um, that you do to, to get more black people in the seats of your auditorium. So that one's called Worship. It's a concert overture by the late Afro-American composer Coleridge Taylor Perkinson. I actually featured um, a recording of that work on a radio series that I did earlier this year. Shout out to Gateways Festival uh, Orchestra and Gateways Radio for uh, putting that piece on my radar to share with audiences. And shout out to Kellen Gray and the Royal Scottish National Orchestra for putting that phenomenal work in front of many more people over in Scotland and beyond. I'm rooting for our brother over there in Scotland, uh, and I hope you are too. Shout out and thanks to (laughs) Kellen Gray and his entire team. All right, real quick triloquy for you this week. So earlier this year in the late summer, I came here on the podcast and talked about how I've been working to challenge my ego as it pertains to a Buddhist concept called human revolution. Okay, so what this means in short is that we all have fundamental things about our personalities and about our karma that may not serve us to the greatest degree we can serve ourselves. So the exercise is to identify those personality traits within ourselves and to see what we have to do to shift things around toward our own benefit. I'm beginning to realize that my human revolution is learning how to deal with not just authority, but stratify ways of thinking about individuals within certain frameworks. You know, I've been on this podcast for a long time talking about conductors and, you know, how they're standing in the way of progress. And I think that's a manifestation of just my not liking this idea of authority, certainly not authority over me. 
Uh, we can talk about it, you know, on uh, as it pertains to the other type of work that I've done being on the job. When I was fired from American public media, it made national news. But that was by no means the first time I was fired from a job for standing up to the people that I felt like <laughs> were um, over me or who, 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 people who felt like they were an authority over me. And not to say that I take anything back or would have shifted anything about that a uh, uh, circumstance in particular, you know, I, I stand in front of that. But my frustration with authority was definitely a part of, you know, what was what what made me act the way uh, that I acted. You know, even again toward a good cause, toward an activist cause, but even so, a cause. Um, I can talk about at my community center where I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo alongside many other Nichiren Buddhists. I've been finding myself frustrated with reserved seating for certain people based on their positions within our non-stratified organization and not to disparage anyone there, but just being honest about my feelings. Even when it comes to growing up, I would never think of myself as a bad child. I don't think my parents would say that, but I definitely bucked their authority and <laughs> their thinking and their wishes many times. That, that goes for many of my teachers. Anyway, I'm listing these things because there is a through line. Whether I've been right or wrong in my engagements and dialogues with these people over the years, the through line is that I am challenged by the idea of someone being in charge of me. Like any other liberation minded black person, I think it's healthy to have a bit of that. I, I am proud for that to be a part of what makes me me. But I want to grow as a human being for the next 70 or 80 years. I get to be here on this planet Earth. So there has to be a balance. And I'm exploring what that balance looks like. Uh, for me, I've been really considering where I should continue to push and where I should allow others to take the lead and be a follower or supporter of what other folks are doing. You know, working with the American Composers Orchestra has been a great help and a great benefit to me because it's allowed me to be in a very important leadership position while at the same time challenging me in the best ways, especially when it comes to the board of directors that I uh get to be led by. <laughs> I'll say shout out to all of them. All of this to say, as you continue to think about the arts and how you can make a positive impact coming into spaces and conversations as you are, especially if you're a person of color, think about your own growth. It's not always about benefiting this system and this structure for the next generation. We have to benefit from this as well. My Buddhist practice teaches happiness for self and others. And I think that we have to think about that balance as well when we think about human revolution and, and shifting ourselves to a, a greater good. Yes, we want arts institutions to change and expand to serve today's populations. That's vital. But what change and expansion does this require of us? What does it require of you? Once upon a time, I wasn't so interested in dialoguing with conductors, for example, because I saw them as the problem, as I mentioned. Now that I've grown beyond that specific issue, I'm able to connect with people like Kellen and celebrate the good work that is being done. Who are you uninterested in dialoguing or collaborating with? these days? Is it white folks? Is it men? Is it folks of a, a particular um, socioeconomic class or status? What are the change points in your life that you see could benefit you by pushing your ego to the side a bit and, and shifting your thoughts around some of those things? Where do you want to be as a musician? Where do you want to be as an entrepreneur or a business person or just as a human being in general? And what do you need to adjust internally to get there. We can talk about external factors, but what has to be adjusted internally? These are questions that I ask myself all the time and ones that I invite you to explore as well as you continue in the work, however you do the work. Thanks so much for following me on this journey of decolonizing classical music. I'm going to uh, have my friend Jonathan here, I don't think next week, but in a couple of weeks to help me talk about uh, my recent visit to the Metropolitan Opera to see the life and times of Malcolm X. I'm looking forward to uh, diving into that conversation with y'all in a couple of weeks. Uh, but in the meantime, keep on pushing and I'll talk to y'all again next week with a new guest, uh, a new triloquy, new things from uh, the world of so-called classical music and uh, new inspirations to help us continue to fight the good fight of breaking down these status quo and creating a new infrastructure of classical music for all of us. Thanks again. Cheers. See you next week. Mm -hmm.